But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that the opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Thus far the reading of God's Word this morning. Now, in the, in the little research I have given to this topic, I have discovered uh, at least one um, historical root of how the, uh, the tradition of Father's Day, uh, it has its origin in medieval uh, Catholic holiday, um, one called the Feast of St. Joseph. Uh, Joseph, of course, being the stepfather to Jesus. And a holiday was to take note and recognize the work of the Nutrito Domini, which translates to the Nourisher of Our Lord. I think that's just a wonderful title for Joseph, the Nourisher of Our Lord. Uh, as he's growing up, he's not, he's, you know, he's, he's doing, he's a nourishing the growth of that child, that, even that remarkable child. And that's important, you know, perhaps like you, you know, before I read this, found that out, I had always been of the opinion that Father's Day was, uh, you know, just an afterthought, right? Uh, kind of an also-ran prize. You know, giving due notice to the man of the house after we salute the woman of the house, right? Oh, yeah, we, we have to remember the fathers, it's also of interest to note that scriptures do give a good account and attention of fathers in terms of their responsibility to their children. It's the fathers who are called to teach their children, more so than the, than the mothers are, in terms of their responsibility with regard to instruction and guidance and encouragement. But as I said a few weeks ago about mothers on Mother's Day, rather than focusing just on fatherhood in honor of Father's Day, God's Word seems to deliberately take a broader approach, addressing, recognizing the faithful Christian male at every age and at every stage of his life, consistently calling him to grow in his understanding of what it is to be a godly boy, a godly teenager, a godly young man, a godly husband, a godly father, and, should the Lord call within the church of Christ a godly deacon or a godly elder, urging that man to apply God's wisdom to every role in life that the Lord will give to him. You know, when you look at the world today, when you look at our world today, and you see how, tip, how the typical male conducts himself in the world, you can readily see why such instruction, such as Paul giving his young protege Titus here, uh, is important 
throughout the entire life of the Christian male. It's not only necessary, but it is critical. While it could be said that women, and I'll say this broadly, okay, so don't hit me with your purse. While it could be said broadly that women have the tendency to worship their youth, men have the tendency to worship their immaturity. Men must still have their toys. Can I get an amen? Amen. (laughs) Why do I do that? (laughs) They still have to have their childhood games. They still, you know, the games they once played outside on the field for exercise and enjoyment. Now they have to continue to have, only now it's turned into professional sports, which they sit on the couch and watch. They continue to be fascinated with strength and power, whether it's their favorite superhero or the size of their motorized tools. (laughs) And because men are prone to worship their immaturity, it is the man, more often, who is resistant to taking on responsible behavior. He will excuse himself for his unwillingness to make or to keep promises and commitments. It's become commonplace in our day and age that he will tell his girlfriend he's not ready to settle down and make a commitment, and so the girlfriend will move in with him. The man is more often the one with a propensity to distraction, usually sexual distraction, because he equates that with fun and with self-indulgence, and because he thinks it is an affront to his masculinity to have to turn away from eroticism, to see time spent on pornography as a problem, and to stay focused instead on priorities and staying faithful to those priorities and loyal to the people in his life. It is the male of our species who will be more inclined to begin smoking and drinking, who will be the first to indulge in marijuana, ignoring its long-standing health concerns, which, yes, are there, as well as other more foolish, dangerous, and toxic drugs who crave sexual voyeurism and experiences and who will gladly lead the compliant female down those same paths. Because of those propensities, it is very proper for us in the Church of Jesus Christ to have first given attention to Sarah's daughters, giving attention to the need in the home and in the church to be raising strong Christian girls, because men in their immaturity are coming after them. And we cannot wait until our girls become mothers to try to redeem their lives. Young girls can often, you know, be attracted to a boy's bad behavior. But when they move in with or they marry their favorite bad boy, they discover that they now have a bad man. They have a bad husband. And as a result, he can quickly become a bad father. The solution the Scriptures tell us is also not to wait to teach and to train that man, not to wait until the boy becomes an adult, a husband, a father, but to train him as he grows from boyhood so that he will not only know right from wrong, but so that he will, Lord willing, be a man of faith, of strength, and of self-determination and discipline, so that all his life, all his life, he will be a son of Abraham. Now, to remind you of the context here, Paul is writing to his young minister, Titus, who, is, who Paul left on the island of Crete. That's just off the coast there in the Mediterranean Sea, and it's the largest of those Greek islands which lies just south of the Aegean Sea. And Paul was eager for Timothy to raise up elders to lead that church. He says you need, to, you need to raise up the spiritual men in the church to be elders. And it is from Titus chapter 1, and you can look at this if you don't believe me, 
that we have one of the two basic lists of qualifications for what the Holy Spirit gives and requires from the one who would aspire to be a church officer. But Titus, Paul says, you're going to have your hands full. He writes in chapter 1, There are many men who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers. One of the Cretans, it's not a foul language word, it's, it's the Crete, remember, they're, Crete, they're Cretans. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And Paul goes on to comment from his own experience, he has to agree with that assessment. That's not Paul's words, that's some philosopher in Crete saying that. They're all upsetting their families, starting with their own, as well as bringing strife into the whole community. When Titus finds these men in his church, Paul teaches that they are not to be overlooked. You don't just dismiss these ruffians, these guys with hard edges who come into the church wanting to know what this gospel is all about. You don't just chase them out, you embrace them. You receive them, you keep them in the church. So for the rest of the congregation, of, of, the, of the rest of the men in the congregation, they are to be taught these qualifications of maturity, these character qualifications that every elder in the church is supposed to have. These are your aspirations. This is where you are to strive for. This is what you are to become. So they might not just become physically mature, but also mature in their love and devotion to Christ. And so here in chapter 2, Paul is giving, to the, giving us the sum of Christian manhood. What is the sum of Christian manhood, Paul? He says it is, a, this, it is this, discipleship is a lifelong journey. Discipleship is a lifelong journey. Paul begins here by focusing on the older men first. The clear reason he begins with older men has to do with Paul's main instruction, which is to raise up those elders. You've got to have elders. You can't depend just on yourself. You've got to have elders in the church. In our day in society, you know, when lifelong focus is on retirement, it is a very common response among the older men in the church. Once their children are grown, you know, their businesses are all taken off, uh, their priorities are behind them, they announce that they're retiring from the church as well. They'll say those very classic lines, it's time for the younger men to step up and take the lead. Paul is clearly telling Titus to defy that notion. Don't allow it. Focus on working with the older men first. The older men in the congregation are the ones who have experienced a lifetime of Christ's faithfulness to them. They know of what they're talking about. And who have testimonies of God's faithfulness and forgiveness. And these are all important. These are vital lessons that the church needs and which younger men need to be equipped with so that their spiritual strength and resolve will be built upon those models they see in those older men who, if they would just stop for a minute and ask, would be glad to tell you, let me tell you all the ways God has been faithful to me. That's precisely what makes the Church of Christ grow stronger. It's not the younger men, it's the older ones. Looking to the patriarchs among us is what inspires and leads us forward. That is what makes us strong. And it is from the older men of the congregation that Titus is to draw from for the offices of the church, to serve that congregation sacrificially, to support the, the pastors to, in their full-time efforts, to minister and care for the people, along with the growth in their character. You know, those older men have experienced those many years of walking with Christ. Titus is now also to teach the older men the soundness of doctrine so that they think clearly and they teach clearly so they will be effective in their own ministerial efforts and supports and labors. So when your elders reach out to you, brothers and sisters, 
offering their shepherding groups to you as a way for members to come together in fellowship. Do not regard those efforts lightly. Do not say, well, I don't do that kind of thing. I've got other things I want to do. Attend those meetings, those fellowship gatherings of support and bonding because you need, you need to be there. When they teach and when they counsel you one-on-one or in small groups, when they counsel you as individuals, when they carry your burdens in a troubled marriage, when you, he works with your families because he's had young children, maybe they've gone through the very same things you're going through. It blesses you, it strengthens you, it gives you hope. Your elders can also take time to visit the elderly and the infirm among us. Such personal care and attention in the church is absolutely critical. It's the elderly, the ones who are shut in, they are the ones who feel the most abandoned, the ones who give up hope so quickly. All they need is the care of an elder from the church. And then Paul then turns to address the younger men in the church. And he does so with the same emphases and the same goals that he lists for the older ones. For these are to be guided in charting the course that they are to take in life, rather than just be left alone to find their own way. First, Paul says they are to become sober-minded. The best thing a young man can be challenged to do The best thing a Christian young man can be challenged to do is to begin to take the calling of Christ seriously. Even when a young man makes a profession of faith and claims Christ as his Savior, it's a struggle in his youth to live for Christ as his Lord. Many young men will convince themselves that, you know, such a step Coming up and making a profession of faith is unnecessary. It's legalistic. I don't need to go there. They do not think they need to bother with the instruction and the modeling older men can give them in the Christian faith. For while they appreciate the Christian community, most of their friends are here, their fun is here, they've got all kinds of things they enjoy here. Nonetheless, they are unwilling to set aside the idol of their own immaturity They do not wish to commit to Christ to consider the needs of others over their own. Young men need to be challenged early. They need to be challenged often to see the idols that they have set up in their own hearts and minds not as their friends, but as their enemies. They need to, to come to the point of conviction and persuasion, and to deliberately tear down those idols they have built themselves in order to honor and live for Christ. Living for Christ must start soon, and it must be a lifelong discipleship. Only then will behaviors, you know, such as temperance and balance and moderation, only then will those kinds of things actually become attractions to them rather than an abhorrence. Only then do they come to see the wisdom and benefits of celebration and joy rather than binges and regret, of refreshment and delight rather than drunkenness and addiction of consideration of others, devotion and commitment versus deceit and deception and suspicion and heartache. The success of young marriages and young families literally hang in the balance as these young people grow regarding this call to be sober-minded and how the young man in the church chooses to respond and to react to that call. He has to make that choice before he meets the girl. The trust that a young wife wants, the trust that a young wife needs to place in her husband is so fragile, so easily damaged, so difficult 
to repair. When a young husband insists on continuing the worship of his own immaturity by insisting on his right not to be sober-minded. Second, they are to live dignified lives or they are to be worthy of respect. Now, this is, this is a funny thing. This is not a character trait that can be turned off or turned on at will in any given moment. This is a cumulative effect on the monitoring and evaluation of behavior over years. Wives are told again and again in Scripture they are to respect their husbands. But it is the calling of the young Christian man to learn what it means to be worthy of respect. How to earn respect and how to deserve respect. You know, dignity and respect are not traits you yourself have control of. They're not things that you can insist others give to you. Instead, they are things that other people give to you after regarding you for who they see you to be. The fruit from the Sermon on the Mount, remember? We inspect your fruit, and then we respect you. Dignity and respect are not to be despised. Such a reputation is not to be thrown away easily or lightly by a young Christian man. They are to be humbly prized. They are to be sought after. They are to be desired more than gold. Dignity and respect will not be gained through force, through power, or through, uh, uh, or, or be, uh, you know, or labor. You can't work your way into that. When these priorities become ignored or mis- mixed up, the young man may say to himself, Well, I'm prospering. I'm getting ahead. I'm achieving great things. I'm advancing. But in truth, If he's surrendering his dignity, if he's he's surrendering his respect, he will find it very cruelly difficult to get those things back. Well, third, along with these other efforts, he is to be self-controlled. Paul mentions self-control three or four times in this text. I guess he means it. Being self-controlled as a young man, of course, is the opposite of being a fool by the definition of Scripture. Psalm 14, verse 1, opens up with this line. It says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. As a result of what he truly thinks in his heart, so are his true words and his true actions. And the rest of that first verse goes on to say, They are corrupt, they do abominable deeds, There is none who does good. A young man must learn, sometimes very much in the hard way, how to control himself. He has to learn self-control so that he becomes sensible instead of being impulsive or spontaneous, so that he weighs the larger picture in context rather than fly off the handle and follow his anger, so that he reserves his speech and chooses his words rather than letting the fire from his own mouth set a blaze he cannot control. And then fourth, he is to be sound in faith and to be as steadfast. Left to themselves, many young men introduced to the gospel, you know, are kind of like the, the disciples that we read about in Luke 24. This this takes place the day of Christ's resurrection. And these two disciples, who we don't know of any other time, are leaving Jerusalem and are going back home to Emmaus. It was the very first, it was that very day that Christ rose from the dead, but these two young disciples who had once decided they were going to be committed to Christ have now decided to give it all up and they're going back to the world. You see, the church needs to be in the place of Jesus acting out that parable. The church needs to come alongside those disciples who are giving up on Jesus. We need to walk beside them. We need to encourage them. 
We need to speak to them. We need to reveal the truth to them. Until just like those two men, their hearts will burn and they will return back to Christ with a yearning and a desire to grow more and more. But you leave them to themselves. You let them walk out the church and you just say, okay, well, forget you. Then they will go back to the world. They will go back to their idols. They will worship their immaturity and you cannot change them. We dare not give up on the young men in our midst just because they are still wrapped in immaturity. Rather, we need to encourage them to see the truth, to teach and to model them, to be involved in their lives to the point that the Holy Spirit will burn in their hearts as well and make them want to seek a steadfast life. That takes discipleship. That means taking those imperfect people who have habits that we don't like and words that we don't like and all these other things we don't like and embracing them rather than pushing them away and dismissing them. I'm saying, yes, you can grow also. This is the direction you must go. You must strive for that. That takes discipleship by the church and by the Holy Spirit. That's what it takes to get a young man to the point when he learns the truth of the Word, when he actually can say, yes, I see it, and I I agree with it. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold. That is the direction we want our young men to go in. That's what we want to see them as truth. And when he wants the blessings of discipleship upon himself because he understands that, to him will be the words of Psalm 1, Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Pray with me if you would.